You know that song, Fly Like an Eagle, that they played in Space Jam? They should change that to Fly Like a Falcon for Space Jam 2. Because guess what Falcon did a lot of today? He flew. Oh man, did he fly. Him and Fe- him and Winter Soldier, they both just flew in this episode. It was so good. Marvel's done it again, baby. We're back right into it with a one-week break. We had our week off, and now we're just, boom, right back into this Marvel action. In the 1970s, when they made Superman the movie, their tagline was, you will believe a man can fly. I think whoever made that tagline was technically thinking about the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. And they're like, you know, <laughs> give us 50 years and we'll do it. Mm-hmm. But we'll, mm-hmm. we'll advertise it now in the 70s because we know it's coming. We, we know that, you know, <laughs> it's like Back to the Future. You, you might not be ready for that yet, but your kids are going to love it. And <laughs> here we are. Here we are on <laughs> Infinity Rewatch. Welcome, everybody. I'm Andrew Fantasia. What's up? I'm Ryan J. Whitehead. And this is episode one of the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. One of six? I'm going to put a question mark on that because we got confused a bunch about the number of episodes of WandaVision. So I think six is our final tally for what this show is going to give us. Six plus one? Yep. It's six. Okay, so okay, I feel like we're in court. Uh, so for the record, uh, to put it on the stands here, people, this is going to be six episodes, one hour each, or like 50-ish minutes. Six episodes, one hour each. Got it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. You heard it here in this court of law first. <laughs> now, Will, if, if you could yeah. please, Ryan, if the person uh, who assaulted Falcon and Winter Soldier is in the court today, please point to them. <laughs> and that would be uh, a George Batrock. Uh, good to see, good to see, go, good old George Batrock back in, uh, back in the the uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier. You know, <laughs> I love it. No, I I will say the it's funny because the trailer, as we know, did not like it. Did it set the tone, but it didn't give you anything. It mm-hmm. told you nothing about this this series that we're going to see. Um, and what's crazy about it, and I left a note in uh, in our little text because, uh, you know, uh, Fantasia and I now have this like tradition that's working out really nicely. Um, and so in there, I put a side note that most of what we saw in the first trailer was legit the first episode. Like it's it's pretty much well cemented in there. Now, that being said, man, what a way to kick off this episode in a high octane, super soldier, G.I. Joe-esque, you know, action sequence um, that I absolutely loved. What a way to set the tone for Falcon. Uh, And so, yeah, he just flies his way over. Clearly, Sokovia Accords are well in effect. He has to he has to be able to uh, rescue this soldier before they cross the border. Otherwise, you know, they're they're no longer in the jurisdiction. So it was really cool to see that in action. And then he comes across uh, George Batrock, H-A, a.k.a. the Leaper. Uh, good to see him back with the fighting just in its peak. It's so good. And what made me very happy was he actually leaped. Uh, I think a couple times. Uh, and I yep. think, I, I don't remember what he looks like in the comics, but when he had on his little glider suit with the black and yellow, I think that was kind of winking at his comic outfit. Is, am I right? Or, or like how he looks like, what's his costume like? His costume is actually kind of like a purple. Uh, it's it's kind of purple with like yellow suspenders. And he has like the, the kind of motorcycle thing, goggles thing going on with like a cap with like a leather cap on top of it. He's a very weird looking guy. Um, but I mean, I love what they did with them. We kind of saw uh, a, a more modern approach to it in the first one. Mm-hmm. And then, so the first one, the outfit looked like it, looked like what it's supposed to with the straps and like the, the kind of layers to his outfit. And then this one kind of had his color palette more to uh to what we we recognize from the comics but what's interesting is is that they're they're using like 70s like and my as my brother said like zed class 
characters here. Like they're taking <laughs> they're taking characters like that nobody would have picked. Like just nobody. Like Red Skull is like your top top tier cat villain. Zemo is another good top tier cat villain. Uh, like actually, Cap actually with Winter Soldier and Civil War, you kind of or even with this trilogy, you kind of run the gamut of his like top villains, which is like Red Skull, uh, Crossbones, uh, Zola, and uh, Zemo. So you you've already just cleared it like you just cleared the whole roster right there. Um, so now uh, it's pretty cool because we're getting the Leaper, who is a, a villain of his. Um, and uh, we'll talk about uh, we'll talk about another villain that's that they're going to be running up to. But uh, I mean, I could talk about it now, but we'll wait till we build it up a little bit. Well, I, it was good to see the Leaper. It was very good to see the Leaper. And I think if I remember right when we talked about winter soldier the movie i should it's so hard whenever i say the winter soldier i always have to like clarify to myself like andrew are you talking about the character or the motion picture uh so <laughs> in, in the movie captain america 2 the winter soldier colon um that uh, that app the podcast episode we did we talked about it i i remember us saying like how it was cool to see batrock and we i think we mentioned how he is you know, in, in a perfect world, we would have more Captain America video games. And he is the definition of a first boss. Like he is just low rung, like as your brother puts it, Zed list, first boss kind of super. Villain. He's like, he's like the shocker, you know, you're never going to have a Spider-Man game where it's like shocker is the final dot. Like, no, he's not. He's, yeah. So it, Batrock showing up again as the first boss of Falcon and Winter Soldier was like, yeah. We're, we're on the right track. It, it really <laughs> feels like, just from this one episode, it feels like we watched, like how, in the same vein, kind of how Spider-Man Far From Home was the epilogue of all the Infinity Saga. This feels like the epilogue of the Captain America trilogy. But it's not even that. Like, it's, it's yes, it's that, but it's it's going back to that fun word I love to use of legacy, right? Like, Stark's legacy ends and then it kind of con- it, it concludes and yet continues with Spider-Man, right? Yeah. Or the way they set it up. But I mean, he also has Rhodes, but it seems like Rhodes is doing his own thing as as Rhodes does. Rhodes was never his sidekick, um, which they do make a comment on. He he stands on his own two feet, but is like a, he's like another he's the military's Iron Man. That's that's the way it is. Um, and so with Cap, it clearly the, the, the legacy concludes with, uh, with the Falcon, which is brilliant in my opinion, and what a great way to do it. And then you also have the best friend who's a military person as well, which is Bucky, um, which is really cool to see. So it's a nice, just, again, uh, it, this is one, one thing I love when Marvel does it right, the passing of the torch. Um, but you're absolutely right. Yes, this is definitely the epilogue of Cap's legacy. Yeah, and I have a legacy question for you. Um, oh, yes. But before I ask you that, really quickly, do you think, like, in the writer's room when they were working on this show, you know, do you think somebody pitched the idea, like, because we, I, neither you or I expected Rhodes to show up, and then he showed up in this, we were like, yeah. Hey. So do you think at one point in the writer's room, somebody was like, let's put Rhodes in this show, and then one of the other writers is like, Rhodes, where we're going, we don't need Rhodes. <laughs> I definitely hope that conversation happened. Um, so funny, I'm, I'm going to insert my story about this show right Ooh. now. So... Uh, first of all, guys, as again, we, uh, you know, we talk about this podcast and don't forget, like, make sure you're tuning into the Rebel Scum Podcast Network. You're checking out all the wonderful content. I mean, you got all that wonderful Star Wars content uh, and you got more Fantasia on there. I mean, if you can't get enough of this guy, there's more, there's more, there's more. Um, so uh, that being said, don't forget to subscribe. While you're listening to this, hit that like button. Just as, as I heard today, Hulk smash the like button. Just Hulk smash it. Um, and yeah. on top of that, leave a comment on your thoughts. Uh, we we had someone do that earlier in the last episode, um, and it was awesome. So love hearing your thoughts and feedbacks and your questions. Please send it forward. There was a viewer that was on my Twitch channel on uh, Xbox Canada, and their name is Chrissy's. Uh, so, Hi, Chrissy's. Uh, hello, Chrissy's. I uh, hope you're listening to this because this is hilarious. So 
my luck with with running into people affiliated with Marvel is pretty interesting. Um, so the first time I've had a situation similar to this, I was in a cab or sorry, I was in an Uber in the States during E3. And we were picked up by this lovely young lady, just like just an absolute lovely young lady. And she was driving me uh, and, and, our, and my and my uh, my colleagues to the event. And I was talking about my passion for Marvel as 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 I would when you find me in a conversation with nerds. She had, um, she so, had no choice. You were going to tell her about your passion for Marvel, whether she liked it or not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we were talking about Captain Marvel coming out, and I'm you know I'm surprised I didn't talk about the story when we talked about Captain Marvel. Um, so I was in I was in this Uber ride, and uh, and she's like, "Oh, it's funny you bring up Captain Marvel," and. And I'm like, why? And we, we at the time, yeah, we were, no, sorry, we weren't heading to the convention. I was taking them to Universal because uh, Microsoft was treating them to a trip to Universal. Um, and, and she's like, oh yeah, no, I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm like, it's weird, you know, living in LA, what's it like just going to these theme parks all the time and stuff? And she's like, well, this is a normal trip for me. I work at Universal. I'm like, oh, that's really cool. And, and she's like, yeah, it's funny you talk about Marvel uh, so much and how you're passionate about it because my my husband is the one of the writers for Captain Marvel. And I was just like, duh, like, just a, a like it was an epic moment. Um, I think I do have the picture with this person. So I, I, I got to see if I can find it because it's absolutely hilarious. Um, oh, my so, God. Yeah, yeah. So Chrissy's comes on Twitch and I was I was playing Marvel's Avengers again. The game is so much fun, um, despite the the rough start this game had. Uh, it's really cleaned house, like it's cleaned up everything. Uh, they just introduced the the new Hawkeye expansion, and they did a great job. Like they just it's it's an amazing game. And so while I was talking about my excitement for Marvel yet again, uh, Christie's is like, oh, it's funny you mentioned that. Um, I'm a big fan of Marvel as well, and I love WandaVision. We had a big one division talk and Chrissy's was like, Oh, my friend, uh, her, her, uh, her mom, I think it's her mom, uh, her parents, one of her parents is the director of Falcon and winter soldier. Are you friggin' kidding me? I am not kidding you. This is a real person that I talked to on Twitch. <laughs> We've had many one-to-one conversations about it. And in fact, uh, I was talking to Chrissy's and we were getting ready for Falcon Winter Soldier and we we're hyping it up. And Chrissy's like, oh yeah, no, you know, I'm, I'm very excited. I'm very interested to see this director's debut and, and see how they do. Um, and I'm like, oh yeah. And she's like, but it goes without saying that their kid, uh, their daughter ruined my Legos. So, you know, if this is good, we may make amends, which is funny because this this episode has the amends to do with it, which is pretty funny. Oh. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I will never forget that the Legos have been destroyed by this person. And it was really funny. But yeah, it, her 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 friend, uh, her friend, her parents is uh, is one of the directors of Falcon Winter Soldier. Wow. Well, Chrissy's you, your friend's mom is talented. <laughs> as hell because that was a mm-hmm. great great first episode uh wow, that's so neat <laughs> that is right? really neat. Yeah. i know my head explodes and and you know and and chrissy's like it's just so cool to like run into you because we were talking about we were talking i think i first met chrissy's during a star wars stream and we were talking about squadrons and then uh, and we were getting into marvel as well um but yeah when when chrissy's dropped it we were playing marvel's avengers and just like very cool See, it all ties together uh, <laughs> I've, I've got a Marvel story uh, that I'll share too. And then I'll ask you the legacy question, because this is a big legacy question that I really. Oh yeah. Like. I forgot. Yeah. Sorry. No, <laughs> no, no, no apologies. That's sir. I love that story. Um, I, I just an, about an hour and a half, two hours before we started recording this podcast, I found out that Marvel is hiring a story manager. So I applied. No way. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. That's amazing. Yes, you did. You put your best foot forward, man. You submit that resume. Can I can I read you the, the cover letter blurb I wrote for them? Because yes, I, I think you'll appreciate it. I um, hope it's oh man, I hope it's got that classic Fantasia flair that you always add. So 
this was my cover letter. I don't know who, you know, I don't know who's reading it. So I put to Dear him Kevin Feige. Dear, dear Mr. Feige, I love your movie. My favorite part was, was <laughs> when the Hobgoblin. Um, so I wrote this. To whom it may concern, I'm writing to apply for the position of story manager at Marvel. I have several years experience working with interconnected fiction, blah, blah, blah. You know, the stuff they like to hear. As a writer, I'm dedicated to bringing quality, fun, and above all, humanity to all of my stories. From 2004, I have been writing multiple novel series, each with interconnected plot lines and ensemble casts. As a fan of impactful storytelling and a fan of Marvel, I believe I'd be an invaluable addition to the team. I know I'm not the first to say this, but I'm constantly impressed with how well Marvel has kept all of their plates spinning, and I would love to be able to sit around that campfire with the other talented members of the parliament, adding my own tales to the MCU pantheon. Whether I get to join your super team or if I'm destined to just observe from afar like Uatu the Watcher, my sincerest thanks for your time and consideration. On your left, Andrew Fantasia. Oh my God, yes, yes. <laughs> give him the job, just give him the job. Oh my God, I hope you get it. Oh, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Mm. Uh, people who work in Burbank, California usually like to hire other people who live in Burbank, California, but maybe a good Canadian boy can sneak in who there. knows who knows we live in a new age man a new technical age where working closely doesn't matter anymore <laughs> I know. Oh, so boy. wow well yeah. i i hope you get it man all the best i i, I, I really want you to get it <laughs> fingers crossed everybody out there cross your fingers for me don't worry if i get it i'll still do infinity rewatch i just can't tell you any secrets that's all that's fair that's fair you can um, just poker face it and make me run just speculations like crazy we'll work out a shorthand you'll be like andrew blink twice with one eye if hulk <laughs> dies in the next movie <laughs> uh <Yeah>. so <laughs> so let's talk about legacy for a minute because mm -hmm. i don't know if you knew about this going into it i did not know about this going into it maybe i'm just out of the loop but the the thing i was not expecting was for Falcon to be like, I don't want the shield that he just gave me two movies ago that we, uh, we have been sort of driving towards this conclusion of Falcon's the new cap. What does this mean? What does this mean for him? What does this mean for the world? What does this mean for shield or whatever? And we start off with him being like, Nope, Smithsonian, you can have cap shield. I'm just happy being Falcon. That was not something I was prepared for. And it, it takes that concept of passing the legacy and it really throws it for a loop. Obviously, I guess that's going to be the, the arc of the series, for lack of a better word, is him coming to grips and being like, no, actually, maybe I do deserve that shield. But what did you make of this? Were you prepared for that move or were you like, oh, no? Um, I was prepared for it uh, because... I was prepared for it because Cap in in the comics has had a long legacy of uh, so many people trying to take the mantle and then it doesn't work out and then and then Cap comes back and does something else and so Cap's Cap's mantle has gone around a few times and not everyone gets it right away so I think that this was kind of a natural progression um, but I like it because what's interesting is. And I think the speech covers it is, is, is it's, it's about the man who holds the shield, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone tries to replicate the cap formula and it never works. It, you get really unstable characters that get it. Um, there's a group called the power brokers, I believe is the term. Uh, and Ooh. they, they try to recreate caps formula, but it doesn't exactly a uh, be the formula doesn't exactly apply the same way. Um, there was a character, Jessica Jones, who is actually a representation of the power brokers. Uh, his name is Nuke. Uh, and clearly he's a very aggressive individual, but I think that this is, this is Marvel's brilliant storytelling in the sense of like, um, and I don't want to, I don't want to take this too out of terms or too political, but they're always doing a social commentary on today's world on, on and what things mean and what, what they, what they mean. And then addressing that in the comics, what they mean and how characters interpret that meaning. Um, and I think that it's beautiful. And especially with Falcon and Winter Soldier, um, it's going to be so good to see. So for example, um, you know, once, 
once we get to see more to the story, I think we're going to see the different approaches to what it means to be Captain America. And, and, and I think what's great is, and this is why I was prepared for it was when I think some of the best leaders I've ever seen are people who are reluctant to take leadership. Um, and I think that's why to me, Falcon was not really surprised that he turned it down because uh, uh, like I said, like every example I've been with, uh, every example I've been with here is there's been a lot of people who've been reluctant to take a leadership role at times and, uh, and they've end up being some of the best leaders we've had. So, uh, for me, like, uh, if I'm going to name drop somebody is, uh, my, my old former, former person in the role that I'm currently in, uh, his name is Fred Lee. Uh, Fred Lee actually went on to work at Microsoft, but when he came into this position, he was reluctant to move uh, into a more leadership role, but um, he he ended up defining it in a way he felt it was best, and he ended up being a, a great fit for it. So it was really cool to see him evolve uh, in the process that he did. And um, yeah, and then uh, and and again, I've seen other leaders come in, and again, they were they're more quieter about being a leader, and they've been some of the best I've ever worked with. And another name I would drop is Richard. He's an incredible leader. So. Yeah. Uh, to summarize, totally. I, I totally saw this coming. And I think I think in terms of storytelling, even for you, I think it I think it'd be it's always a treat to see the character go through that uh, hero of a thousand faces where they refuse the call uh, mm -hmm. at first. And now they now this is classic storytelling structure. But I think as, as a writer, you can probably add, uh, add more to this. But I think it's interesting to see that that pattern of like, you know, you you have the answer the call of the venture, but you always refuse it at first and go back to kind of the the world that you're in. But then you ha are kind of pushed into this threshold and you go through this whole process. So I think what you're saying is Mephisto is going to be the villain. <laughs> 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 yes that's exactly what i'm saying it's funny you bring that up because yes you texted me that like two seconds into our watching you're like mephisto confirmed uh we had that moment together uh but you know what's funny it's funny you bring up the mephisto thing because they were talking to the original i i don't think it was the direct it was either the director or the producer executive producer of wandavision and they were talking to they were talking to her and she had no idea who Mephisto was. Ooh. So clearly it was like that's that's not <laughs> Mephisto. Excuse me, Mephisto's not a thing <laughs> in one division. That being said, maybe they had some gears turning, but they didn't deep dive into the character. Who knows? Maybe. Or she's just really good at keeping secrets. Um, mm -hmm. you're you're right though. The 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 call to action and all that and kind of turning down that uh, that mantle is completely where the story should go. And I think what shocked me the most is the fact that they shocked us with something that is the obvious choice. I think that's what's really neat about it. It was, you know, where you have something like, like WandaVision was great at shocking us with twists and turns and like, look at the shock. This did something completely standard by storytelling practices. And it mm -hmm. still threw me for a loop. Um, and I think that's because just Marvel just got me on that hype train of like, yeah, he's the new cap. And it's like, oh, wait, no, of, of, of course he needs an arc. He's not just going to be, you know, the new cap right off the bat. Of, of course, that, that makes total sense. And, yeah. and now, like, my big question is um, the, the whole idea of if, if Falcon ends up putting on the suit and taking the shield and becoming Captain America – do we how do we what does that world look like where captain america is a guy with no serum uh, and does this new guy have the serum uh like that those are the questions that i'm thinking now uh that make this a really interesting thing because if winter soldier puts it on it's just exactly the same thing except now it's bucky instead of steve but now not only is is sam also the falcon but he's a he's a human guy He's not, you know, throwing cars and like grabbing helicopters and tearing a muscle in his bicep. So what does that Captain America look like? What does he do? What do they ask him to do and, and uh, who's going up against him? Mm -hmm. That's what I think I want to see in the future. But I love this whole journey that he's going to have to go on. I, I love that it's about him accepting the shield because you're right. It's a big legacy to accept. 
Uh, so mm -hmm. just him taking it and saying yes, nowhere near as interesting as what we got. Yeah, like you, uh, Isabella said it great when we were watching it together. She's like, she's like, I would not want to be the person filling cap shoes. Like you, you just don't want to be the person. You don't want to be the person replacing that person. You know what I mean? Because that's that's you're just setting yourself up to fail, right? Like, and and it's beautiful. And and the the greatest thing too, going back to Rhodes is uh you know it's it's awesome to see that we're getting that interconnectivity where we're we're seeing uh Rhodes now uh hanging out with Falcon and I love and and Marvel has been doing this brilliant thing where they're saying exactly what the audience is thinking. In fact, when I watched it with Isabella and her mom, like they were asking questions that were immediately answered like seconds seconds after they asked it. So it's kind of this beautiful uh, it's kind of this beautiful thing that they're doing with and with fans too. Like we know, like comic book fans, we know when certain characters are going to play the roles they're they're destined to play. But the, the beauty is, is they take Marvel takes their time to catch everybody up, and then the big moment happens. It happened with Wandavision, um, and spoilers if you still haven't watched it, but uh, it happened with Wandavision where we knew from Age of Ultron who. Wanda was. We knew she was the Scarlet Witch. But the show uh, and the movies, because uh, people in the back of the theater, as they say, as my brother mm -hmm. so poetically puts it, um, is that they they don't know who WandaVision is as a hero yet. And yes, they can go on the internet and find out she's Scarlet Witch. But assuming you're not that type of fan, they wait till everyone's caught up and, and everyone's been given all the backstory they needed for the MCU version and then they drop the mic and say, okay, this is Scarlet Witch. And then everyone, and that's why there's this big explosion reveal, literally, that she's the Scarlet Witch. And I think that what's going to be awesome about this is I don't know where this is going yet. I mean, I could speculate all the live long day. And it'll be fun to throw in some theories at this point. I mean, my brother, my brother is not wrong in the sense that you know, speculation, you don't want to get your expectations too high and then, you know, have no Mephisto at all. But at the same time, I think that it just, again, it's that conversation of investment. Like we're so invested. I'm already thinking of like a thousand ways the stories can go. These stories. Can yeah. Go. Especially because we're mm -hmm. so early on and because we don't know the plot yet, even like going into WandaVision as mysterious as that show was, we had an idea of what the plot was and we were all mm -hmm. pretty much right. With this, we really don't know yet. Um, now we, I have, I'm having trouble figuring out which which scene is my favorite between two particular scenes. But one of them is this therapist's office. Um, first of all, she's got a beautiful painting of like a forest behind Bucky, and I've never seen such a detailed painting in a medical office before. But I want that. That's oh god, that's beautiful forest. Um, mm -hmm. and this whole, the back and forth between her and Bucky, I was, I'm sitting there listening. I'm like, God, I want to make my students perform this scene. Cause this is really, <laughs> this is the great scene where she's like, give me your phone. Give me, and, and then he, she's writing and he's like, oh, that's passive aggressive. Like this was beautiful. That was a great little Marvel scene. Uh, but something else that's a contender for me, I think in this episode was something I'm glad they touched on. And it's um, Falcon, or not Falcon, I should say, but Sam and his, his relationship with his sister, uh, Sarah, her name is here. Because uh, I really like that they explore that Sarah needs money because this whole idea of like, it's something that, you know, I never really stop and think about, but it is something that could be called attention to, which is that none of these, you know, we never hear about how the Avengers make their money. Uh, but like, I'm sure Stark was buying them things, but they always seem to be loaded. They have whatever they want. Um, and you never get the sense that they're being paid to avenge. Mm. You know, they didn't turn in Loki. And then Al Alexander Pierce was like, okay, here's uh, $50 for you. You know, they, he wasn't handing out pink slips or anything either. It was just sort of like a agreement they made as friends to go punch this God. Uh, and, and it just continued from there and it snowballed. So I love getting to see Sarah Wilson here have to, you know, fight to get a mortgage or whatever, fight to get a loan rather, excuse me, from the bank, something that we're all unfortunately familiar with banks 
Uh, they're the real villains here. Yeah, it was uh, a, oh, you beat yeah. me by uh, one second. I was about to say that. I was about to say that. We'll be talking about the villains later, but we all know that the bank is the real villain in every story. Um, but that just that that whole concept of like he he wants to save the family boat, that to me really rings true. This idea that's it's not even something I felt like I needed because I hate money. I hate talking about money. Money's boring. Keep your money out of my Marvel. But I like that they kind of at least looked at it for a second and said, yeah, it is weird. Like, where is this guy getting his money? Where are all these people getting mm-hmm. their money? Um, but it also gave me something cool to look at in terms of world building because like uh, the whole blip, the whole snap excised all these people from the earth. And now, like Sarah said, there was no income for five years because we didn't exist for five years. Like, what do you want from us? And staying true to their form, the bank is like, oh, we don't care. Uh, so I, I, I really liked these two scenes. I thought they were very uh, beautifully written, very subtle pieces of Marvel cinema. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's, I mean, I love, <laughs> I love how the bank is the villain. Um, I agree with you though. I like I like that they talked about it. But again, it, literally seconds before that scene happened, Isabella was talking about. Isabella was asking. I was like, how? Why? I mean, if they're with Stark, why aren't they just like? Why isn't everything paid for? Mm-hmm. But the the thing is, is that it's all goodwill. It's it's like it's like Falcon said. It's all goodwill. And uh, and I think that the way in my mind the way it works. Um, I, as I would imagine, is is that when you work for when you are an Avenger um, and you're living at Stark's complex, your food's taken care of, your sleeping quarters are taken care of, and like I, I don't know any other kind of necessities. But you're not you're not being paid like millions of dollars to be these these things. Like Stark could not do that because then he's funding private weaponization, and like that's probably gonna that's probably going to cause some law issues and stuff like that. Like, right. like I'm sure there were some, I'm sure there's like some laws and stuff around it. I mean, but that's like, again, super details that I don't think we need. And I think the way they did it in this scene was perfect. It's like, it's a lot of goodwill, but Hey, you know, now that I'm back with the military, I'm getting all these government contracts and all this stuff. And it's like, okay, cool. Well, that's all we need to know is like, okay, yeah. Why does he need to go to debt consolidation? If he's with them, this is why boom, let's move on. And yeah. it's 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 a great scene. It's it's really well done. And I love how he tries to exercise his fame. And it's like, well, no, it doesn't work like that kind of thing. So, um, uh, but uh, yeah, it was it was really really good. And it was a great scene. Uh, uh, my favorite my favorite scene thus far though is still Bucky's story. Man, I really like where they're going with Bucky's story. Um, they have the uh, they have his whole amends thing, and I love the, yeah. the scene where he takes the takes the remote car and just drives around this Hydra agent for a little bit and then gets them arrested. And I love that he has these rules, can't hurt them, um, can't hurt them. Uh, and then uh, the other one was um, make amends. And then I can't remember what the first rule was. I think, but, uh, yeah, the first rule was um, don't, do nothing dangerous, don't damage anything or something like that. Yeah, uh, yeah, second don't do anything dangerous. And then the second ones don't hurt anybody. And the third yeah. ones, whatever. Oh, and, and he brings um, but, up the great question. Like, why is that not rule number one? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it kind of plays on Dr. Strange's humor, right? Where it's like, why, why don't they put their warnings in the beginning of the book? Right. Yeah. So it's kind of, kind of a nice structure there. So I love where they're going with Bucky's story. And I think they're going to do some pretty cool stuff. You could technically argue that, that you know the Wolverine card could be played. It could be played in this because with Bucky's story, it kind of makes sense. You could, he could find a kindred spirit, another lone wolf, if you will, mm-hmm. um, uh, with within uh, Mr. James Hallett. My brother was making a hilarious joke where it's 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 reaching that Wolverine will be there. Like it is like the same with Mephisto. It's like it's reaching that that's going to happen. Um, but my brother thought it'd be funny if you like imagine like Hugh Jackman being like um what is it old uh patch uh patches where Wolverine disguises himself as a bartender in Mandapore <laughs> and then like you just see Hugh Jackman come up and be like, What up, bud? Like we're not I don't think we're gonna get that. But my point is is like I love his story about finding these people and like making amends. And there's a whole list. 
Uh, there actually is uh, some names in that list that bring some uh, some legitimacy to it. Uh, so the the interesting thing is um, the interesting thing is there's the comic book guy in there. Um, uh, there's a there's a name in there from a comic book guy. I think it's not Kaminsky. It's uh, like one of the writers. One of the yeah, writers. he's like one of the writers or creators. I think it is Kaminsky. Yes, I remember you showed me. Kim- yeah. There was a lot. There was a couple of Kaminskys. Yeah, there's a Kaminsky. Yeah. L. Kaminsky is an actual a comic book writer, uh, but there is another guy in here. Uh, his name is Rostov. Rostov. Rostov is actually a Marvel character. That's possible. That could be possibly in. Um, could be possibly in the Marvel Cinematic Universe uh, in the sense that this character is called the Red Barbarian and he works with Russia. Ooh. Maybe yeah. he has a cameo on Black Widow. That could very well be it. So, mm. um, so yeah, so that was, I thought was interesting. There is one character in there that actually is related to comic book character aside from Zemo, which props to you. You caught that on the first shot. You're like, you saw Zemo right out of the gate. <laughs> yeah, that was the only name that stood out because I guess my brain was like waiting for some Zemo goodness. Uh, mm. And we, even though we didn't get Zemo in this episode, it's okay. He's he's slippery, right? Even in Civil War, like he's barely in it. He just kind of slips around, does his own thing. But let's talk mm. villains here because we did yes. get um, something going on in Switzerland where bags of money, I think, were, were changing hands and a bunch of people wearing masks. What's that about? With the hand of Saruman? Oh, are, yeah. they, are, they orcs? are these people yeah. orcs, Ryan, is the question. <laughs> well, my friend, so... Um, uh, is Bucky going to so, be like sneaking up on one of them and then they're like, man flesh? I will... Okay, so I'm going to save Infinity Rewatchers out there, you, you watchers... I'm going to warn you guys now, do not, I repeat, do not go looking for Flag Smasher uh, <laughs> on the internet because they will spoil something for you. Um, but being that being said, I knew, I kind of knew where it was going, uh, but I didn't, I didn't expect for a spoiler to be slap me in the face right away. Oh. Um, so be careful. I've been, I'm not going to spoil it for you. But what I will do is explain the 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 the, the reasoning behind it. Okay, so um, so yeah, so the hand, so the red hand thing, I thought that was really interesting because there is a ninja group called the Hand, um, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, the I like this symbol. I kind of like this underground, you know, terrorist group, if you will. Uh, but they're called the group is called Flag Smashers. Now, it, Leaper is a pretty cheesy character, but there is an actual villain in Captain America uh, in 1985 named the Flag Smasher. Is an actual Captain America villain. He wears a he wears um, he kind of looks like Space Ghost if you want to kind of <laughs> kind of get an understanding of what he looks like. He's he's kind of Space Ghost. He has a white he has a white shirt and then his cape and cowl is black and he has red eyes and he has uh, a, a he has that planet symbol under on, on his belt he has a symbol of the planet um and it's like his black belt and then he has black pants and white boots and this whole nine yards um so uh yeah it so flag smasher um actually in the comics is uh the son is the son of a wealthy swiss banker so i thought it was interesting Ooh. because when we're introduced to the official flag smasher group um they were actually robbing a swiss bank so that was that was pretty funny and also a great nod to the comics so flag smasher um is a pretty weird character uh flag smasher does not like nationalism uh, so Flag Smasher goes around toppling governments. That's what Flag Smasher likes to do. Fun flat, fun fact: Flag Smasher actually likes smashing flags. Uh, I was going like to say, I hope so. Otherwise, they're <laughs> a liar. They should call themselves Flag Liar if, the, if they're not going around smashing flags. Well, what I what I think is interesting about Flag Smasher uh, and and the reasoning that we bring this up, and I don't think a lot of people are talking about this from what I've from the research I've done on various YouTube channels. 
Uh, I would not. I would say that Infinity Rewatch is the one of the one of the few that is actually talking about this, which is in the first Captain America, uh, Red Skull did not want, uh, or sorry, Red Skull was like, you could have the power of the gods, yet you wear a um, you wear a flag on your chest and play a game of nations, right? Mm. That I think that's the line, not quote for quote, but but that's the line. So. Um, there is, seems to be that theme now connecting full circle, which I thought was interesting because that was the first movie where he talks about playing a game of nations um, and, and you know, being above and beyond that. So Flag Smasher, uh, it, morals seem to be centered around the idea that they believe that the blip was the best thing to do because there is no nations with the blip because there's not enough people in the world to make up each individual country, I guess, if you want to look at it that way. So uh, I think Flag Smasher was actually a really great choice. And I like the idea that Flag Smasher is a group. Um, and I think that I think that's really interesting to see what's going to happen with that. And what I like now is, it, again, it's playing with Cap's story, is the whole idea that we're going to see... I think what we're going to see is the different ideal idealism of... Uh, of Captain America, like what Captain America is and stands for. And I think that first speech is is really critical. I might need to watch it a couple times because, again, pay attention to the language of of what they're trying to tell you, the audience. What are, what are they foreshadowing, right? Yeah. Um, so I can't wait to see all the different kind of looks at how people think the world should be as like a Captain America-like character. Uh, but I'm super stoked. I'm super, super stoked. And I thought the flag smasher thing was cool. I don't get the red hand over it. So I don't understand that one. It could be a red skull reference. Um, it's possible. It's possible. But again, this is far reaching stuff. Red skull has a daughter Ooh. in the comics. And she runs a organization as well. So maybe maybe that's like the hand over the planet smasher thing, or sorry, the flag smasher thing. But I don't know. That's again, that's long reach. It could just be it could just be the updated version of uh, the flag smasher symbol, which is just maybe taking matters into their own hands. Does Red um, Skull have red hands? Or is Red are... Skull Red Skull's hands are red? Yes. So he's red everywhere. Mm -hmm. yeah well he's not red everywhere but his hands are supposed to be red. how do you know you've seen it all have you yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. let's uh so, the... so it's really cool it's really cool to see these flag smashers in here um i'm curious to see what they're going to do with this group i cannot wait i think it's going to be pretty pretty stoked but i think we're going to see i i'm still betting that we're going to see different iterations of cap's serum and and how it's applied to different people well the serum i mean the one of these flag smasher folk they toss that dude pretty far like those are strong mm -hmm. i don't know if they all have this strength i don't know if flag smasher in the comics has strength in them but if if this is a movement of people with that power and they all have it yikes like so uh, and uh, i feel like they're not all powered like that because if they are I, I feel like robbing a bank is small potatoes like they should be doing something more with their time um but yeah the, the, the that whole movement really has me interested i knew nothing about flag smash until you taught me just now um all i know is zemo is coming uh, whether he's connected with them or not, I guess remains to be seen. But are we, because I know what I think is going to happen with him, but are we to expect a villain out of the new U.S. agent here at the end of our episode? Because the thing with him that I think was so perfectly done is... Mm -hmm. How do you tell the audience with no words in the span of like a second that this guy is not like Steve Rogers? And all you got to do, wink at the camera and smile because that is not Steve Rogers, baby. And that tells me so much about this dude. I, like I, I can't get over how 
good that is in terms of introducing a character with no words, with nothing, just like that. So this guy is not Steve Rogers. I'm expecting a smackdown between him and Falcon Winter Soldier for sure. But are, are, is he a villain? Uh, in the comics, I'd say his, he's got a very colorful history. Um, he's actually quite an unstable individual. He's probably mm-hmm. labeled as an anti-hero is probably the best way to say it. Um, think of, uh, think of a very, think of Punisher essentially is what you're looking at. But, uh, but again, is he kind of gets carried away and he does become a villain at times, but he jumps, he, he runs, he gets, he jumps on all sorts of sides. Um, so he's like the he, Venom to cap Spider-Man. He looks like him, but like the darker evil yeah, version. Yeah, yeah, that's a good uh, way to look at it. That's a really good way to look at it. I, I don't want to kind of obscure too much because, again, we don't know how this character is going to play out. Mm-hmm. I mean, it seems pretty obvious this guy is going to be not uh, not a nice dude. Uh, but this guy has a lot of anger issues, a lot of anger issues. In the comics, his history is kind of interesting, though, because he, he, um, he wanted to prove to his brother that he could be as good as he is, right? He was very inspired by his, his brother. Um, so he decides to join the army. And as he joins the army, he feels that he's not up to par. He's still not, he's still not there. He's still not where he needs to be. So he finds these people called power brokers and they, uh, they give him caps power. And then he joins he joins a wrestling group. Um, he, he essentially goes into this underground military wrestling thing. And uh, and then he realizes that he can be more and then decides to become like the next Captain America. And he goes out there and he, he gets pretty violent. Like he gets pretty ugly violent. And uh, and then Cap has to come in and, and stop him. And then Cap... Uh, recruits them all to fight um, to fight a much bigger evil organization at one point. But, but yeah, at first this guy goes out and he's not exactly the best Captain America. At first things seem okay. And then you start to realize he's a pretty ugly, ugly dude. And he starts, uh, starts doing people dirty by like beating the snot out of him. He sounds kind of like Homelander from the boys. I think that's actually that's the best way to relate to him. Mm. He's definitely kind of a Homelander esh character. Um, what I love is, you know, and, and props to this director who apparently, you know, <laughs> apparently Chrissy's nose. And uh, but yeah, props to the director for this one shot um, comes down. But the shot is kind of like a master shot. It's about it's about just above the just uh, just around the waist and up, and it's it's a nice wide shot. Um, very, very good establishing shot, but for, but one thing that draws your eye that I, that I saw was that you can see he carries a gun. Yeah. And I didn't notice that till you brought it up and I looked at him like, Oh damn, he does. Yeah. The original cap world war one cap carried a gun with him. Um, and, and, uh, and then in winter soldier, he stopped carrying a gun from that point on. He only had a shield. So uh, clearly, at, clearly at some point he's just like, yeah, no guns, and um, yeah, now this uh, this U.S. agent is uh, clearly he's on the offensive now. What if the show uh, shows us his underground wrestling origins, and he goes into a ring, and he's like, I'm ready to fight. Who's ready? And then his opponent comes out, and his opponent's like, Boom saw is ready. <laughs> I I would love to see Bone Sonic come back. I know we'll never get Macho Man to play him because unfortunately he's passed on. But uh, I would. Oh, love that's to see right. Bonesaw. Damn. I would Bonesaw love versus Bonesaw. Crusher Hogan. Make it happen. Oh, oh. yeah, I would love that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I think that I think that I, I I'm excited because I think we're gonna see so I think we're gonna see that ugly side of Captain America's history that we're we're gonna get. We're going to get a deep dive into, and I think that's going to be really cool. I think that's going to be really awesome. It does sound awesome. And I think you just answered, by describing U.S. Agent, you answered my biggest question from the end of this episode. Because as soon as it ended, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting back and I'm thinking, okay, that man with the really nice beard at the Smithsonian, mm-hmm. made, would they, he made a point, like they made a point to tell us that he asked falcon to donate the shield 
like during that speech, he's like, thank you for listening to me and, and doing this. You made the right choice. And I'm like, okay, that guy really wanted Falcon to give up the shield. And then at the end he comes out and he's like, look what I got. I got a new Captain America. So this guy is immediately, as my students would say, sus. Uh, so I'm looking at him and I'm like, okay, what's his game? What's this guy's angle? He's controlling a Captain America. That's got to count for something. So you mentioned the power brokers. So now that's where my head is going. Are are these, I'm, I'm imagining the Marvel Illuminati, but greedy. Is that along the yeah. right lines? Think of like, cause like, cause you have to understand Cap, the Project Rebirth, um, Project Rebirth was developed by the government, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so at the time, at the time, it was like the government's best minds all coming together to make, you know, this this weapon, this super weapon for for the allied forces. And it's they believe it's humanity. Right. So they make Captain America. And that's why I love that wars are not fought with weapons. They're won by men kind of line um, or sorry. Wars are fought with weapons, but they're won by they're won by men. Um I love that kind of ideal. So what I'm thinking now is that this time around is that the, I think it's more of the private sector side of the America that create the, kind of like a secret America Illuminati, a mm-hmm. private group that that finds a way to create a a knockoff version of the Super Soldier Serum. Right, and that's where I think this guy's coming from. Uh, as soon as he said power brokers, like I pictured like like him and a bunch of rich dudes around a table, like basically Hydra, but motivated by money instead of like some political, like quasi religious aspiration. I feel like they're just like, how can we get money? Maybe the guy at the bank works with them too. It's probably a power Mm -hmm. broker. Um, That's that's something I'm looking forward to exploring too. Just like immediately there's so much room for world building in this one little episode. And there's still five more to go. And it really feels more like we saw a chunk of a movie as opposed to WandaVision felt like we saw an episode of a show. Yeah. They really mm-hmm. have differentiated that. And I think they've told us that beforehand, like this is going to feel different. This is going to feel like this and that's going to feel like that. And they were right. Like this feels way more like a, a part of a movie than WandaVision did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and again, Wanda, WandaVision was very on its own with its like mm-hmm. TV shows and the, the, the TV show thing. Um, what I like about this one is I think it refers a lot more to the after, like the, the aftermath of everything because they talk about the blip. They talk about, they talk about Sokovia Accords, like everything. Um, but like it's, but I think it's closer to home. Whereas WandaVision, she was isolated for a reason kind of thing. Um, what I have questions about um, that that we can kind of theorize real quick on is that, like for me, first of all, we know Zemo is going to play a card in it. So so for for Bucky's story, it's about these this, this psychological process he's going through. Um, so with Zemo, is he going to find more about his history of you know, being the winter soldier or like fully completing this story about him becoming the winter soldier. Um, and then he's going to have to take down Zemo without killing him again, kind of thing that, that maybe that kind of story. Cause I think those three roles might have to be how he takes on Zemo. Cause Zemo could be, uh, uh signed up with the Thunderbolts at this point. So he could be a government agent, uh, and which, which Bucky has been confirmed that he's no longer working for the government. He is a quote unquote civilian, Mm -hmm. Um, so we don't know if he's going to, I mean, the trailers are suggesting he may return as, as a government personnel, but at this point, um, he's very much a civilian and, uh, and he might have to fight Zemo and then he might have to follow those three rules. And then, and then Zemo might get away with it because he's, he might be, he might be one of Thaddeus Thunderbolts, Ross Thunderbolts, you know? (laughs) If they bring in the Thunderbolts, that would make my day. I really have no idea what they're going to do with Zemo. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Like, last we saw him, he's in prison with Everett Ross. Um, He's in that cage. So, like, we don't know how he gets out of that. We don't know what he wants now that he's 
like he finished his mission it's essentially in civil war like he put the gun to his head and he was ready so black panther yeah. kind of stopped them so like what's now something has to have come and given him a will to live because the last time mm. we met zemo he had no will to live so that's going to be interesting what steps into zemo's life to say no 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 not only are you going to want to live but you're going to get out of that cell you're going to put on a pink mask and do some stuff that is what I'm looking forward to the most with Baron Helmut Zemo. Maybe he'll become a Baron in this because he's not a Baron yet. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. I'm excited. I'm hoping he does become a Thunderbolt. I know from a rumor I saw, from like set photos I saw, that they're they're going to introduce a character potentially. I don't know. We might We might have seen this person already, but we might not. So I don't know if this person comes into play, it's going to be, I don't want to spoil it. So I'm going to, I'm going to let, I'm going to let you guys kind of marinate with this, but I think this, if this happens, it's going to be an interesting pattern of things we're going to see, which will beg to question what will happen in Loki, which also Ooh. Loki, we did get the poster for that. And Loki has been confirmed for June. So Ooh, we, okay. yeah, we're going to have, we're going to have Falcon and Winter Soldier through end of March and April. We're going to get a week off. Then we get Widow and then we get a few weeks off and then we're going to get Loki. And we get into Loki. Well, I heard that in Falcon and Winter Soldier episode four, if I remember hearing right, U.S. agent takes off his mask and he's Mephisto. So, no. <laughs> oh god, now it's gone the from new a nihilist to this guy. Yeah, he's the new Snoke. He's just everybody is him, and he's everybody. Uh, no, he oh, Mephisto god. can't be a nihilist, Ryan, because Christine Everhart's a nihilist. Let's get let's That's get our funny. facts straight here, Mister. Okay, <laughs> That's fair. It's fair. <laughs> but I I think this is a great solid first episode, uh, and it it. It, it felt it was a nice change of pace. Like I love WandaVision. I love WandaVision with all my heart, but it was a nice change of pace to have an episode end where you feel like it should end as opposed to like almost ending mid sentence being like, what now? <laughs> so, it, was, it was like, this felt like if, if this was a TV show, this felt like where the commercial break would be. So it felt like a good spot to end. Uh, it wasn't as cruel of a cliffhanger as WandaVision was. And I say that with the utmost love because I have nothing but respect and love for WandaVision. But I, I like it. I as a Captain more. America guy, yeah, I really hope you dig it so far. I, I, I'm I in love with this show. This is yeah. what I want. Uh, I was yeah. joking around with my brother um, and I, I, we were, I was like, you know, I'm definitely going to watch this like a few times. And my brother's like, you know, don't BS me with this. Like you're going to watch it a bazillion, gazillion times. Cause like, it's true. This is, this is my mar. This is the Marvel I enjoy. I mm -hmm. love seeing, I love seeing <laughs> the best way to phrase it is I love kind of seeing this like superhero wrestling match where we're getting, you know, <laughs> essentially these characters introduced and then it's just an epic throwdown uh, of mass proportion. Uh, so I'm, I'm very excited about that. Uh, but what I like, what I also like about Captain America's story is because Cap's story influences everything. Like it, it, it influences everything that exists in Marvel and the Marvel Cinematic Universe because he's like, he is that, that perfect hero character. And now he's been taken out of it. And I love how we're seeing like the different morality of characters and like how that affects it because Cap was the, the center stone. He was the moral compass for everybody. Now he's taken out. Everyone's just kind of going these different directions. And the one one person you want to take it and lead the, that compass um, is not doing it. So it, the, the how it's going to twist and turn from there, it's going to be really just an amazing ride. And of course, I just love, you know, super soldier dudes just, you know, dealing out the, the dishes you know, dealing out the, the violence. It's great. Uh, I love it. I think at the top of the show, you, you referred to it as feeling like GI Joe. And I think that's a really cool comparison. Mm -hmm. Like even Zemo's mask looks like Cobra commander's mask. Like it's, oh, it yeah. feels like this feels like the GI Joe movie that I think GI Joe fans wanted. Um, 
We GI part. Joe fans, we got retaliation with The Rock, and that was like that yeah, was perfect. Yeah. They should have they should have continued that. I mean, look, it's not going to win any awards. It's not like your super amazing story, but visually, that was GI Joe. Like oh. that was the GI Joe I wanted. I remember that trailer with the the Cobra flag coming down over the White House. I was like, damn, this oh. is cool, <laughs> right? <laughs> with, yeah, the, like, uh, with the remix of Seven Nation Army. Oh, so yeah, good. Yeah, I liked Retaliation. Um, but I I think that this this little grab bag of characters that they've given us is great. And I love what you said about Cap being the moral compass and now everybody's scattered. I wouldn't be surprised if when it comes time to have the next big team up, Avengers 5, whatever, it's got to be Falcon who brings everybody together. Or Sam, rather, because maybe he's Cap at that point. But it's going to be mm-hmm. Sam who's got to be the one to be like, come on back. We need you. Yeah, no, it's true. It's true. I think that uh, you're absolutely right. And I mean, they're off to the, the they're, they're off to the right foot. Marvel is just crushing it. I'm sorry, DC. I'm sorry. I still haven't seen the new Justice League yet by the time of this recording. But I'm sorry, Marvel is still proven that they've got it. They know exactly what they're doing, and they're just loving it. They uh, like I. I will just say the the Snyder cut of the Justice League made me cry. It was beautiful. It was oh. everything it needed to be, uh, and it's so personal to him and to what he went through that the fact that it exists made me so happy. Everybody out there, you obviously have good taste in superhero stuff because you watch the Marvel stuff and you hear us talk about it. Watch Zack Snyder's Justice League because it's masterful. It is. It, it looks like the Sistine Chapel. Like it just looks like art. Um, mm. I I cannot recommend it enough. I also cannot recommend enough everything that Ryan does when he's not on Infinity Rewatch, which is remind us. Oh, wow. Lovely transition, uh, which is you'll catch me on streams on twitch.tv forward slash Xbox Canada, just dealing out the latest games, latest content. Um, and man, just a lot of games right now, a lot of content, uh, which is fantastic. So you can check me on there and then you catch me on Twitter at Crusader Online. Uh, and yeah, that's it. And then where can they catch you, sir? You can catch me also playing games, but older games because I haven't bought anything new. I actually found out today that they had to delay Gotham Knights till next year. And I was so excited for Gotham Knights. Damn it. Ugh, it's okay. It's like they say, you know, a delayed game is only delayed. A bad game is bad forever. Um, so delay all you want. Uh, but you can catch me on the Twitter and the Instagram at Andrew Fantasia and on YouTube at Andrew Fantasia and on the Rebel Scum Podcast Network where you can hear me talk about Star Wars. On my Andrew Fantasia YouTube channel, I literally just put up my review of Zack Snyder's Justice League as well as a, a video essay called Justice for None about the history, the troubled history of that movie and of Zack Snyder with the DCEU. Uh, very, that alone is interesting enough to be a Hollywood movie. Just what happened in the making of the DCEU. Uh, I, I can't wait till the day comes when somebody makes that into a movie because that story is just stupendous. And it culminates with this beautiful Justice League cut that we finally got. Uh, and yeah, that's where you can find me. I'll tell you, you can't find Flag Smasher because wears a mask and all of his friends do too. So you can't catch him and he throws you into lampposts on the streets of Switzerland. But... We'll find him next week, maybe, or the week after that. All I know is Mephisto's in episode four. (laughs) So until next time, until next week, everybody out there, please have a marvelous day. Hey, scumbags. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up on our video. As always, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Rebel Scum Podcast, for all the latest videos.